Hi everyone and thank you for joining me in this live presentation. Now in today's uh, live we're going to be talking about selecting preservative for cosmetics uh, live, we're be and we're also going to be going through cosmetic regulations, a bit of an overview. Both of these topics are far too big to cover uh, in one hour but what I wanted to do was just run through some of the most important bits that I want to make you aware of and then we're going to open up live to your questions. So we do have some questions people have sent through earlier, but we will be preferentially answering the live questions that you post today, obviously because you're right there watching. Um, so one of the first things I wanted to go through is actually we've just launched, this is a bit of exciting news, a bit off topic, but we've just launched our Cosmetic Formulation Fundamentals Masterclass. Now this is entirely free. It's a fundamental program to help make sure that you get started right if you're looking to formulate cosmetics and even some fantastic brand tips. So if you're wanting to, to start your cosmetic brand or build your cosmetic brand, we've got some great tips in there to get you started right. The big emphasis of this masterclass for me to, to bring to you viewers is that there's so much misinformation out there on the internet and I wanted to give you a good foundation series that's going to get you started right. Um, in that uh, program, there's a 50 plus page booklet with a lot of information that we, we cover in the lectures. There's 15 lectures, there's three forms Formulas. Two of them are organic, uh, an organic shampoo, an organic cream. We've also got a hydrating mist. We've got loads of other topics in there, and it's really about establishing the right information from the very start. We've got a lot of next steps and links as well. So if you do want to do additional training or you do want additional learning in a certain area, where do you go for that information? So that's come out today. That's on our website. If you go to our workshops page or our free uh, free formulas page, you will find the links there. Just again, it's totally free. You just put in your details so that you can get access to the lectures. The lectures are password protected, so we do need to email it out to you and you can start enjoying it straight away. So now let's get on to our preservative topic. I wanted to go through some of the myths that you hear about preservatives out there because I want to make sure, again, that you're making the right selections or, or you're choosing your preservatives with the right things in mind. One of the first things that we often see um, people talk about when it comes to preservatives is a lot of new formulators think 1% is what you need. Um, now, for some preservatives, this is fine. For some preservatives, it's far too much. And for some preservatives, it's too little. So the key message I want to get out to you here is don't just assume that all preservatives need 1% because that is not correct. Um, you do need to consider each preservative and its blend uh, individually and make sure you're making the right selections for your formulas. And also preservatives have a range of activity. So again, you might find that 0.7% is enough in a certain formulation type, 1% is needed in another formulation type, or again, different preservatives need different inputs. The point is, don't just put 1% in your formula thinking that that's going to be the blanket input for every single preservative because it's not correct. Uh, another thing when people are first formulating is they, they think that, oh, well, I'm making a conditioner that has quite a low pH, so therefore I really just need to protect from fungus. I don't need to worry about protecting from bacteria as well. For those viewers of you who aren't aware, bacteria grow preferentially and best in, uh, in a more neutral pH range, but they'll still grow. These are incredibly opportunistic organisms, so you need to make sure that all of your formulas that contain uh, the water input have broad spectrum protection. This is really, really important. So too, when you say working with a formula that say a pH of around nine, again, new formulators might think, well, oh, I'm not going to have a fungal risk in this because again, fungus prefer a more acidic environment. But again, it's still not correct. Please remember these are opportunistic organisms and if you give them half a chance and if they're there, they're going to grow. Now, when you have a product and you put it onto the market, regardless of how small or how big your company is, the company putting the product onto the market is responsible for the safety and regulatory compliance of that product. So it means that no matter how small or how big you are, you're responsible for that product that you put onto the market. So please don't take chances with your preservative selection. Make sure the formula is protected properly for its individual needs. And that's another thing I want to talk you through in a moment because different formulas have different preservative needs for, for a multitude of reasons. Um, but please remember broad spectrum protection is essential anywhere between a pH of three up to 10, you can get microbial growth. Sure, you might find that certain organisms will grow better in certain pH environments, but as a brand putting a product onto the market, you have to make sure it is safe for consumer use, which means making sure that your preservative is going to protect against contamination. And again, making sure that the input is correct for the type of preservative that you're using. Um, so that's a couple of the myths there. 
Um, another, uh, let's talk natural now, because some of the so-called natural preservatives that you might think are natural are not actually natural. You might be using preservatives that um, are, for instance, suitable to use in a Cosmos certified product, for example, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're natural. So I just want to point out to you that some of these are what we call nature identical, which means they'll be identical to what occur in nature. So chemically, the structure is identical to what occurs in nature and potassium sorbate and sodium benzoate would be classic examples of this. Um, but the, the actual preservatives that we use in cosmetics, um, those ones in particular, are actually synthetically produced because they can't get the commercial quantities from a natural source. So while they are uh, nature identical to the natural occurring uh, preservatives, they're not necessarily always natural. And just because Cosmos allows you to use certain preservatives in their products does not mean that they're completely natural. So this matters where you're saying that your product is 100% natural, for example, and you might have potassium sorbate, sodium benzoate, you might have some benzyl alcohol in there. And again, these things do occur in nature. I'm not saying they don't, but the actual material that you're using in your product is not natural. So therefore you couldn't be saying, if you were using any of those, for example, that your product is 100% natural because it isn't. Um, so again, when we talk regulations later, the company putting the product onto the market is responsible for what they say about the product. So just a little bit of a red light, a bit of a caution there for you, that you check those sort of things. Don't just assume, never just assume, especially when it's your brand, you want to protect yourself from having some sort of issue later. And again, we'll talk about regs a bit later, but just as an example, if you had 100% natural on your label and you were taken to task by a regulator and you you had a, even just a very small portion of a synthetic preservative in there, even if it was nature identical, they have every right to make you remove that product from the market and fix your label. Uh, and I'm not kidding. So one of the things about regulations, and again, we'll have that discussion later, but one of the things about regulations is sometimes people don't take it seriously enough or, or don't know what they don't know and don't worry about what they don't know until they get caught. And then the implications are huge. So again, just a bit of a warning there to keep that in mind. Now, there's also a lot of misinformation out there about natural preservatives. So, oh my goodness, this is a huge topic. Let's go through a couple of uh, things that I really want to make you aware of. Um, and again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use some of these materials. I just want to make you aware of them as part of your selection process. So there's this uh, concept of a static versus a sidal preservative. And you will find that there's quite a few natural preservatives or so-called natural nature identical preservatives that have more of a static activity and what this means is they retard any growth in the product but they won't protect that product against any additional microorganisms that might be introduced and you might say well can you give this a scenario a static preservative like that is not good in a product that's in a jar for example because consumers can re-dip into it and contaminate their own product and in those cases you want a sidal preservative because a sidal preservative will not only kill what's there but also have action on anything that's introduced so just be aware of that. And this is why there's, there's that bit of a, a misconception out there that a natural preservative isn't as strong as a synthetic preservative. This is not correct. There's some really great natural preservatives. But I think that this is where some of the misunderstanding comes from is that people might use a static natural preservative and expect it to perform like a sidle preservative, whether it's synthetic or natural is not the point. It's not a sidal material. Um, and if, where that's the case, you're not going to get the same sort of activity. So just be aware of that as well. And of course, you can definitely find this information out um, when you learn with us. This is one of the things we teach you to recognise with the different preservatives or, of course, ask your supplier. So just be aware of that one as well. Another thing I really want to point out, and again, this doesn't apply just to natural preservatives, but definitely natural preservatives fall in this category a lot more than synthetic preservatives is acidic pH requirements. So there's a lot of natural or nature identical or cosmos suitable preservatives out there that require quite an acidic pH. Now I do want to, especially all of my viewers that are new to formulating, please, I really want to make sure you understand this, this concept, is that when you see a preservative and it says it's effective up to a pH of 5.5, for example, it doesn't suddenly work, 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 and then hit 
pH 5.5 and not work. It doesn't work like that. The way the preservatives actually work is that they will have no activity at 5.5. And again, I'm just picking 5.5 as an example. Um, but they'll actually have a curve. So from about pH of 5, they start to lose their efficacy such that by 5.5, there's absolutely no activity at all. But what this means for you as a formulator, if you have them in a formula at 5.3, for example, you're already on the downhill slide which means you're not getting the best performance out of that preservative in that situation. So when I'm using a preservative and I see that it has a limit of activity of 5.5, I'm always putting that in a formula that's got a pH of 4.5 to 5. And this is really important because it's still got good activity at 5, but then it's going to drop off and it's going to start dropping off really sharply such that by 5.5, there's no protection at all. So please remember, it's not a matter of having this perfect preservative coverage to 5.5 and then it stops it doesn't work like that it starts to drop off before its limit that is stated um, another concept i want you to be aware of is ph drift products will change ph over time they absolutely will okay you can use some sodium citrate buffers to try and limit ph movement but they will move the extent to which they move is what comes under stability testing. And that's Friday's topic, actually, if you can join me for the Friday Live or, of course, the recordings will be available later. Um, but when you've got a formula that's especially high in water, that pH will move, which means, again, if you've got a pH where it loses its efficacy at 5, you want to make sure that you're really formulating that product to a pH of 4.5 to 5 because over the shelf life of that product, it could drop in pH or it could raise its pH. And a raise or drop of around 10%, plus or minus 10%, is quite normal for a product to move over time, which means if I made my product today at a pH of 5.3, for example, it is quite normal for that pH to move 5.6, 5.8 over its shelf life. Now, again, you don't necessarily know which way the pH is going to move up a formula. That is why we do stability testing, to monitor it. Like, you can't just look at a formula. I mean, certainly there's some ingredients where you have an idea of whether it's likely to go down or whether it's likely to go up. But for a lot of your standard ingredients, you won't know. So, again, this is why we do stability testing, to make sure that any changes don't make the product unsuitable or render certain actives or preservatives ineffective. But when you're formulating the product, you need to allow for this drift. So you don't want to start your formula at the limit of your pH because you may find within three or six months that your, your preservative is just not working anymore. And it's not that the preservative isn't working, it's that you've formulated it to the wrong pH to enable the best activity from your preservative. So again, this applies to whether your preservative is natural or synthetic. It just happens to be that a lot of your natural preservatives or preservatives used or allowed in natural products by Cosmos standards, for example, um, happen to need quite an acidic pH environment. Now, again, this means that there may be some types of products, especially if you're formulating a product with zinc oxide, for example, that naturally pH regulates up to a pH of around 7. It means that your preservative choices for that product are instantly going to rule out all of those um, acidic uh, preservatives, those preservatives that need that acidic pH environment. So just keep that in mind because these are things, these are parameters that you need to work with when you're making your preservative selection. And again, we do teach this all in detail with our courses, um, right through from our workshops. We've got workshops that will teach this. We've got our Cos Create Cosmetic Formulas program that you don't even need to worry about this. I've actually created the program and I've actually put that into the program so that the program won't let you make a bad selection. Um, or of course, you can learn it with us. But Really, the purpose of today is to help you get started right and point out some of these things for you so that you don't make these sort of mistakes. Um, okay, so we've talked about quite a bit. I've got some notes here to just make sure I'm, I'm giving you a really good overview. We've talked about broad spectrum. We've talked about static versus societal packaging choice. So again, if you're going to use a static preservative, you're better with like an airless serum dispenser or something where a consumer can't touch the product. Um, sachets are also quite good because they can't. It's a single-use product. Um, different percentage inputs don't just assume it's always going to be 1%. Um, Oh, different country limits and regulations. Okay, so different countries have different limits over the amount of preservative that you can use. Uh, and again, this will differ around the world and it differs for the type of preservative. 
this is something that if you're going to be entering even just your own market, you need to know what those limits are. But if you're going to be entering more than one market, you definitely need to learn how to look up the different regulatory inputs because preservatives is definitely an ingredient where there are a lot of regulations. That's another myth, actually, that I see um, that, you know, preservatives or cosmetic ingredients aren't regulated. Nothing could be further from the truth. They are very well regulated to help ensure the safety of your consumer. Oh, by the way, if you did want a copy of my notes for this presentation, we will have them available over in our Dropbox. So you, if you have our Dropbox link already for all of our free formulas, you will find all these notes in there after the presentation. Um, or you can email info at personalcarescience.com.au for that Dropbox link. And then you can access not just the notes from this presentation but all of our free formulas and reports that we have um I do want to let my audience know parabens are safe and effective and a lot of the misinformation that you read out there about them is simply not true. It's really bad um, information. And again, we've got a video where I have a lot of links to show you the regulatory data and investigations that they did to ensure safety. But this is an example of where a preservative has really, really tight regulations. They are really well regulated because of the amount of research that's been done into their safety. So I do want to put you at ease. Having said that, I do know a lot of brands, a lot of companies just won't go near them. Um, that's your choice if that's what you choose to do. But I just want to alleviate some fear out there. There is nothing wrong with parabens when they're used within their regulatory approved limits. And I can guarantee you there's been tons of research on those materials because of the bad press that they've received. So again, just a bit of an example about, you know, investigating the truth about some of these ingredients. Um, and again, the regulators have done loads of research because of the amount of misinformation that exists about them in particular. Um, the other day, someone even asked me, oh, is phenoxyethanol, you know, safe and suitable? And I'm like, what's wrong with phenoxyethanol now? Like, seriously, every day I wake up, there's another ingredient on a no list. And, and I, don't, I haven't even caught up with what's apparently wrong with that material yet. It is a really good preservative, by the way. Um, talked about broad spectrum, making sure that your um, selections are always broad spectrum. Um, and of course, preservative efficacy testing. Let's talk about this one for just a moment. So when you've actually made your formula, even when you've got great theory about your preservative selection, when you are putting a product onto the market, especially in the EU and UK, and again, we're going to talk about EU and UK specific regulations a little bit later in this presentation. Um, but in the EU and UK, for your product information file, you are required to hold stability data. Part of that stability data is to show that you also have preservative efficacy testing for the preservative you've used in your product. So if you do have a brand, even if you're a small brand over in EU and UK, please be aware that you do need to get preservative efficacy testing done. Now, please know that preservative efficacy testing is not the same as microbial testing. It's a very, very different process and preservative efficacy testing must always be outsourced. So um, let's talk a little bit about where you can get more information and detailed learning about preservatives and then I'll open up and answer some of your questions. Um, first of all, we have some workshops that you can definitely access. Um, we do have our masterclass. We actually have a, a lecture on preservatives totally free from that masterclass that I've mentioned. Um, so you can just access that masterclass and watch and read. We've got notes about the preservative as well um, in that. We also have, can I use a different preservative? Now in our, can I use a different preservative workshop? We go through all the, the main preservatives provided by small suppliers. So again, it's very small supplier focused so that we're looking at materials that you're um, purchasing from small suppliers specifically. We don't list preservatives in there that are only available from the big guys. We really focus on the materials that you want to use from small suppliers in that workshop. Um, then we go to more advanced training and you can actually do our uh, preservative unit from our diploma. So our Diploma of Personal Care Formulation is internationally and industry recognised. It is one of the units that goes towards our cosmetic chemist qualification. Uh, and that unit, of course, teaches you everything I've talked about today, plus so much more uh, in, so, in, in proper detail. Um, so you can do that unit on its own, um, or you can do it as a study only option too. Um, we have, as I mentioned, our Create Cosmetic Formulas program. So our Create Cosmetic Formulas program is a program I designed to help people new to formulating, um, you basically go in there, you pick the type of product you want to create, like cream, 
lotion, shampoo, conditioner, and then you can just pick and choose. The program actually tells you what sort of categories of ingredients you need, uh, and then you can go in and you can choose from there, from the suppliers, that, and we only put materials in that program that you can get from your small suppliers, um, and then you can pick and choose what you want to use in your formula, and the formula won't let you make a mistake. So every formula works when you use that program because of I've put all of that compatibility information into the back end of the software so that it can't make a mistake for you. So um, that's that's a really good thing if you're really new and if you just need to check things or if you, you, you haven't learned properly but you want to make sure you get it right, that program can definitely do that for you. And of course, our preservative unit that I talked about is in our Certificate in Advanced Cosmetic Science, Certificate in Advanced Hair Formulations and Diploma of Personal Care Formulations. So you can study it as a single unit or you can study it as one of our bigger certificate or diploma programs. Um, please be aware our certificate and diploma programs are not just weekend courses. Our advanced certificate programs take 300 hours to complete. Our diploma of personal care formulation, this is the qualification you need to study if you want the cosmetic chemist qualification and to join the IFSCC, to join your local society cosmetic uh, chemists. Um, that there, that course is 1,200 hours. So please don't compare us with you know, some other workshops or certificate courses that might only be 100 hours or less. It's not the same thing. Um, when you want the proper qualification, you want to apply for a job in the industry, our Diploma of Personal Care Formulation is the program you should be studying. But again, please remember, it's 1,200 hours of study. There's no way to shortcut that. Even if you've had industry experience, there's still a lot of assessments um, and tasks that need to be completed to earn that qualification. Um, but definitely the preservative unit on its own comes from there. And then that way, you know, even if you did the preservative unit you know you're getting the proper full professional approach to preservative learning so now uh, let's have a look at some questions oh my goodness there's quite a few let's have a look um, we're going to try and get as many of these answered um, can we use sodium benzoate as a preservative in cosmetics? Yes, you can. Uh, just remember this one needs quite an acidic pH, so you wouldn't want to put it in a formula above pH of 5, even though it can function a little bit higher. As I've mentioned, you'll start to lose a lot of your efficacy above pH of 5, so make sure your final formula is always 4.5 to 5. Never use it on its own. It is not broad spectrum on its own. It pairs really well with potassium sorbate. Even though it's nature identical, just remember it is not natural. It is nature identical. Um, you will find that it actually can be quite irritating but it is um, recognized by most of your organic certifiers you do want to make sure you're only putting each of those in around 0.3 percent tops and you definitely want to check if it causes irritation because it can cause irritation um, do you ever use two preservatives i typically use preservatives that come as a blend already and this is because they tend to have a good synergy when they come together don't over preserve your product okay because preservatives can be irritants so don't fall into the trap of thinking oh, i've got lots of clays and vitamins in this product how am i going to protect it of course they're very nutrient rich materials and very prone to microbial contamination um, so don't fall into the trap of thinking oh i'll just put an extra preservative in because you could actually be then making it uh, unsafe and irritating for your consumer what you could look at there is um, other formulation techniques to reduce the potential microbial load in your formula or reduce the microbial burden on that formula. You can also look at packaging tricks to help reduce consumer exposure or, or re-dipping into the product, for example. These are just some ideas to consider when you have a high-risk product rather than supercharging it with preservative. Never supercharge with preservative. They can be irritating even when they're natural, even when they're nature identical. I just talked about sodium benzoate, potassium sorbate. They are quite irritating. Um, so again, they're not my favorites to use but they do have certain applications where they work extremely well they are very effective but they do require quite an acidic ph so please just keep that in mind um, um and of course, one of the reasons why two preservatives might get used is when you've got, like I say, with sodium benzoate, that's going to protect you against bacteria, but potassium sorbate is going to help with the fungus. So this is why two might get used. Um, or you might get it as a blend. Uh, off the top of my head, Yuxil K712 comes as a blend with those already in it. Um, and they've already done their safety studies and it's already, you know, dissolved so you can add it straight into a formula. There's an example. Of, of where the two preservatives are already present together as a blend because they do work particularly well together. Um, let's have a look. <clears throat> uh, is Yuxil 9010 or Phenoxy Ethanol Blend Global Acceptance? 
again, limits, you've got to check the local country limits because generally speaking, yes, it is, but you do need to check your local country regulations and don't use phenoxyethanol on its own either. It works really good when it's in synergy with, say, ethyl hexoglycerin, for example, which is your Yuxil PE 9010. Um, and again, you need to check your local country regulations to make sure you use it within limits, but it is a really good material to use. Oh, goodness, I think I'm losing track of the questions. I'll try to keep up. Um, how we, oh, we've got a question about determining PAO. Stability will be talked about on Friday, so please join us on Friday and we'll go through that one. How do we check preservative quality before accepting a newly purchased preservative? That you will definitely need to study our preservative unit with us. It is not a five minute conversation. Um, you can definitely do your preservative efficacy testing would be the very short answer, but there's other things to consider in your formula as well. Um, I can't give you an off the top of my hat type answer that it would be incorrect advice to do that for you. Um, oh goodness, sorry, the questions are coming in thick and fast now. Um, if we use, if we make an anhydrous product, actually I've got a few of these um, in the lead up to this live. So let's talk about anhydrous products. If you have an anhydrous product, do you need a preservative? Technically you don't. So if you have a lipstick, lip balm, if you have powdered eyeshadows, if you have uh, or foundations, so if you have totally powder products, you have totally uh, oil-based or balm type products, you have something where there is absolutely no water at all, you, you do not need a preservative. But if that product is going to come into considerable water exposure over its shelf life, then you need to consider if you need it. Let's say a worst case scenario, if you had a, a jar with a, uh, a face mask powder, so let's say it was clay, clay powder with vitamins and things in that clay powder, and you had it in a pot for a consumer and they were told to mix it before application and they're likely to have it by their bathtub and it's likely to get a lot of humidity exposure over time, potential water or condensation on the cap and then it gets closed in there. Again, that's probably not enough water to allow for microbial growth, but I would definitely say it starts to become a risk factor. So you need to consider that. Something like a lipstick or a lip bump, no, there's, there's never going to be enough water exposure, not even from saliva or applications to need to worry about a preservative. So just think about that with your anhydrous products. And also there's a concept of available water. When that available water is really, really low, like you might find in some ointments or balms where there's a tiny amount of water. And I've even got... Um, formulas on my YouTube channel where I'm making a, a water and oil material uh, or, or ointment and I don't use a preservative and that's because the available water is so low microbial growth cannot occur uh, and that can happen but again it's not an exact percentage you'd need to send it for available water testing again these are quite advanced topics um, if you're new to formulating please don't take the risk is my biggest caution please learn it properly so that you can make the right decisions for your brand because you're responsible for the product you put in the market even though I'm giving you some generalized advice today ultimately you can't take this advice I don't know your exact formula I don't know your specific situation I don't know your packaging I don't know what else is in there um, so please if you're going to take you know chances like that please don't take chances but if you're going to kind of sit on the edge with some of these things please learn it properly so you can have an informed decision um, let's have a look um, I've got Campo Research claims honeysuckle preservative is natural. Is this their plant servative WSR? If so, yes, it is. Um, I can confirm that for you. Um, can I use xylit as a preservative? Oh, so xylitol. Um, right, xylitol and sorbitol and even glycerin at really high contents will reduce the available water in your formula such that then it can't grow microorganisms. This has to do with its uh, osmolotic properties. Again, very high level stuff not appropriate for a YouTube or generalized discussion, definitely covered in our diploma preservative unit. So if you are interested in learning how to make preservative free formulas using the ingredients to provide their own preservation, then please study that preservative unit. It's not appropriate for me to give specific advice like that on a, a generalized YouTube channel, especially when I'm not even having a, a proper conversation with the exact person that's asked me the question. Um, but yes, we do teach that. So if you are interested in that sort of thing and there is potential to use it, there absolutely is, but it needs to be done right. Please study our preservative unit so that you can learn that properly. And yes, you can do that. Um, when would you prefer a static over a cidal? Quite honestly, I'd always prefer a cidal. But there may be reasons why you want to pick a static, uh, and that can be to do with your company philosophy. If you are going to use a static preservative, just remember the packaging is important. 
because you want to protect that product from having external sources of contamination. Um, is Populus Trimuloids Aspen Bark Powder? Okay, this is actually probably a good time to talk about some of these. Um, I've, I've seen raspberry extract, I've seen the aspen, I've seen lucidal liquid. Um, these types of preservatives, again, very static in their activity, also potentially boosting only. So would I use them? Well, there's a reason I haven't got them in my YouTube formulas because they have very specific applications that may or may not suit the formulation, the packaging and the other ingredients you are using. So am I saying that they're no good? No, I am not. What I am saying is they have very specific applications where they will work in a suitable way, but they have far greater limitations on their performance than some of the other preservatives that you will see me use in my YouTube formula. So I hope that's really helped guide you. I'm not saying no, I'm saying use with caution and consider every other aspect of that formula and packaging and if it's the right choice for your brand. Remember, again, you are responsible for that product when you put it onto the market. So I really hope that's helped give you some parameters. Again, if you want to start using some of these more on the edge type preservatives, please learn preservative selection properly. This is not me trying to sell my courses here. It is you asking me, can I use Lucidal? Can I use Raspberry? Can I use Aspen Bark? And I am telling you, you need to learn preservative selection properly if you want to use some of these preservatives because no, they will not work under all conditions. Yes, they can work when they're used in the right way. So please heed my advice don't muck around with preservative selection it could lead to a contamination and recall situation and that is the one thing you don't want as a small brand ever you don't want it as a big brand but you certainly don't want it when you're launching a brand as well so i really hope that's helped i know a lot of people want to use these materials um, and again i'm not saying you can't i'm just saying please learn it properly otherwise you could be making a choice that is really detrimental to your brand long term and we don't want that to happen especially when you can learn our preservative unit no joke australian dollars 200 australian dollars study only access and you can learn it properly so for that kind of small investment to learn it properly and then make the right decisions, I'd say you're bonkers if you don't do it. If you're going to want to use these types of materials in your product, it's just a way of protecting your brand from having an issue later. And I say that with, with all genuine intent there. Um, so have I missed some? I think I might have missed some. Um, what packaging tricks do I recommend? Um, airless packaging is really great with static preservatives, um, sachets if you're going to use them. Look, even even pump packs, again, be very careful. You need to be careful because even with pump packs or even with plastic tubes, there is a suck back. So there is a suck back of air, which, again, depending on what else is in the formula, may or may not be okay or suitable. Uh, supplier information mentions Yuxul 9010 efficacy reduced with PEG surfactants. It's not so much PEGs. It's more non-ionic surfactants um, that they're really cautioning you against there. So, again, this is why you need to get preservative efficacy testing. Now, I love of Yuxil. I use it in a lot of formulas. Um, it is very robust. Uh, again, you do need to consider the formula and you need to consider what other materials might be in there that might challenge the micro burden of that product. Um, and again, you definitely need to consider. So if I was making a formula where I had a really high quantity of non-ionic surfactants, I would make another choice. For example um, but where i'm using a combination of different surfactants and then i'm using that as well again it's part of looking at that formula how is it packaged how will it be used what's the final ph then i do use it a lot in my formulas and i do use it a lot in my youtube channel formulas because it is a good preservative so again it's, it's not a no it's um, consider how you're using it. And if you've got a lot of non-ionic surfactants like if the formula is just full of non-ionic surfactants i'd say perhaps there's a better choice um any um any advice on preservative system to use on clay based oil and water products again clays are a high risk material preserve it well if you're going to put it into a jar then don't take risks with some of those you know more newer or innovative or even booster type preservatives it's not the place to to play that game 
Um, since some extracts and all water-based products come with preservatives included, does adding the typical preservative in the formulation create any issues given there could be three or more types to be used? That's a really good question. Thank you to whoever answered that. It's actually really good for beginners to learn this for a couple of reasons. Number one, there is this misconception that if an extract or surfactant or any ingredient, for example, comes with preservatives, if you use enough of them in your formula, those preservatives will help protect your formula. That's not correct. Um, so please don't get fooled into thinking that, hey, I've got an extract or an active or surfactant using preservatives. That's to protect that material while it's in storage. It is not to protect your formula. So then the next part of the question um, is that, is that going to be a problem if you use that in conjunction with other preservatives? No, because again, the amount that's used for those raw materials is purely to protect the raw materials. So when those raw materials are part of a finished product, that preservative is nowhere near sufficient to protect the final formula, which means you're not going to have the normal sort of irritation issues that I mentioned if you were over-preserving a product. You're not over-preserving a product. If you didn't use a preservative, it would be under-preserved. It would not be sufficiently preserved because you can't rely on those preservatives preservatives from those other materials to protect your formula. So no, you won't have an issue. Good point. Good time to turn to regulations now. Uh, and again, I'm sorry if I've missed some of your questions there, but we need to go on to regulations. Um, if you are in the EU or UK, if you are using extracts or actives or surfactants that have preservatives at present as part of them, you need to declare every single component on your product label. Now, this is something that we see a lot of new brands, they come unstuck when they're over in EU and UK, or if they wanna start exporting to EU and UK, um, they come a little unstuck with this because they're like, oh, but it's an incidental ingredient. What I wanna remind you is that there is no concept of incidental in the EU or UK under the regulations, which means that if the component is present, even in the most trace amount, it's got to be listed on the product label. So this is, again, really, really important stuff that you make sure you know. Now, where brands come unstuck is when they start to produce their product information file. So let's start talking about regulations. Um, we'll, since we've started about EU and UK, let's cover that one first. So when you're in the EU or UK, you will need to have what is known as a responsible person. Now, a lot of small brands, they want that to be them, but they don't realise what they don't know. And here's the big danger. If you don't know what you don't know, then you can't know when you're not compliant. And unfortunately, that's not a suitable excuse to a regulator. So when you are in EU or UK, you need to hold what's known as a product information file. And then this information needs to be entered into the cosmetic product notification portal. Can you be your own responsible person? Well, yes, you can. You need to be in the location. So for instance, if you're in the UK, you can be your responsible person in the UK. If you're in the EU, you can be your responsible person for the EU. It doesn't work the other way around, but you need to be there. Um, can you be the responsible person? Well, the responsible person is required to know. They are saying that they are acting in that responsible capacity and that they know and understand their regulatory requirements. So can you just be the responsible person without knowing? No. And this is why it's not acceptable to a regulator to say, oh, I didn't know, because they're going to say, well, when you're a responsible person, you are required to know. So we do have an EU compliance workshop that's specific for EU and UK. It takes you through your entire product information file, uh, everything that you need to make sure that you're compliant with that responsible person requirement. And it also talks you through how to collect your safety assessment. You will need a safety assessor to do the final sign off. Now that safety assessor doesn't have to be in the EU or UK, but they do need to hold certain qualifications. Um, so again, please do that workshop and then you can compile your own product information file and you can act as your responsible person um, and just get that final sign off. So let's have a look um, with regulations. So one of the things I want to mention first is a lot of small brands when they start, again, they, they go, well, you know, they don't know what they don't know and they think that that's going to be a plausible excuse with a regulator. It's not. Um, another concept is that people go, yeah, but when you're small, you kind of get away with it or I've seen heaps of other brands do this. Like, so I've got to compete. I've got to do it too. I want to put it to you this way. You drive a car, you run a red light and if no one is there to see it, you're going to get away with it. But the second you start to grow or the second that there is the wrong person that sees you do the wrong thing, you can be reported. And when you're reported and a regulator investigates you, they're going to say, this is not compliant, explain why and fix it. And you can't at that point go, but I've seen every other brand do that because they're going to say, oh, okay, we'll report them. But in the meantime, now we need to talk about your non-compliance. I cannot warn small brands about this enough. When you're small, you'll fly under the radar. You can run that red light, you'll get away with it, but it doesn't mean you're compliant and it's not a good brand strategy as you build 
we really encourage brands to be compliant from the start. Otherwise, you will come unstuck later uh, and you'll kick yourself for it, quite honestly. So I say start right, learn it right. And again, that's another reason we have our masterclass. So in our masterclass, we do have some great brand building tips um, like this um, about ingredients lists, about some shelf life um, concerns. And again, we have that live on Friday for you. We'll be talking more about shelf life. Um, but little things like, you know, what we've even got a product information file checklist in our masterclass so again it's got this great checklist which talks you through all the different things again you need to do additional study to learn all of that in detail it's not something that can be taught you know in 15 minutes um, but it is in there to make you aware of all the extra compliance so you can choose whether you want to learn more and do it yourself or whether you want to outsource it the point is you will suddenly know what you don't know and when you're armed with that information it gives you much better decision making choices um, so another thing I want to point out is different countries have different regulations over the amount or type of UV filters, actives, preservatives that you can use in your product. Different limits apply all over the world. So please make sure you get to know your local country regulations. Um, also important is that different types of products, especially those that sit at the interface between a cosmetic and a drug, are viewed differently around the world too. So this includes things like uh, your antibacterials, your anti-acnes, even some whitening products. Um, even things like your antiperspirants, hair dyes, definitely sunscreens. These are regulated differently all over the world. Um, and some of those regulations are easier to understand than others. So the point is you can't get away with saying, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm sorry, I've made a mistake. As a brand, you are responsible for what you put onto that, onto the market. Um, so you need to take it seriously and if you want to have a successful brand you need to get it right from the start so please I'm encouraging you to look at the options you have to either do it yourself or be prepared to outsource either way that masterclass has some great summaries in there so that you can find out what you might need to do to take care of yourself or at least then you know what you need to do if you're going to be outsourcing it I've uh, got some additional notes here it's also, uh, I want to talk to you about a concept of um, the how a product is portrayed to a consumer. So you might say, okay, I've, oh, I've got my um, anti-aging product and I'm, I'm not telling the consumer um, certain things. Or, or you might start talking about some physiological claims like collagen building. Well, I can't see collagen building. The definition of a cosmetic is almost unanimous around the world. It uses different words in different countries, but the concept is still the same. And it's about maintaining um, or improving the condition or appearance of the skin or the hair. That's the general concept. Again, you can go to different countries and, and some have wordier definitions and some have less words, but that's the concept. So it's all about appearance based, which means you can't be talking about what's happening inside the skin because you can't see it. So we can definitely say something um, visible if we've got the evidence remember you've got to hold the evidence too but you know visibly reduces the appearance of wrinkles visibly lightens the skin i can't be talking about melanin synthesis i can't be talking about collagen synthesis these are things you can't see you can see the physical difference in terms of skin color you can see the physical difference in terms of wrinkle depth but you can't see what's happening inside the skin so again be cautious when especially when you're working with suppliers um, even small suppliers will provide you with information about how an ingredient might work and they might give you some physiological uh, explanations like I said collagen synthesis, melanin synthesis. These are not claims you can put on your packaging and tell a consumer um, and definitely a lot of claims when a lot of small brands when they first hear this they're like what what but I'm, I'm sure I've seen someone else do it. Be careful with just jumping on to what someone else is saying or doing it doesn't mean it's okay and it certainly isn't an excuse if a regulator comes to you uh, and points out what you're doing wrong so just be aware of that one um and also how the product's presented also matters. So we have seen times where companies have used Botox alternatives. Um, and I've got a great video on that. I, I know uh, I had someone attack me over it once. You know, can you really say it's a Botox alternative? Actually, at one in a court of law, um, some of these materials uh, do have Botox-like activity from a cosmetic perspective. 
just remember that. Uh, anyway, I've got a great video on this. So if you are interested in that type of thing, please have a look at that. My point here is it's also how it's presented. So again, I can't be talking about how it, um, you know, stops muscular contractions. I can only talk about how it smooths the appearance of wrinkles. But also there was a company and they actually put their serum into a package that looked somewhat like a syringe um, to make it look like the product is obviously a Botox alternative. And they had to change their packaging because of the way it looked and a consumer's perception was, that it had a medical or therapeutic effect because of the way it was packaged. Now, I, you know, it, it was it was a, it was a play on packaging, if you like, but the common consumer mistook it as meaning that this product could have therapeutic implications. So again, I'm not saying just that one example, but that's just an example of how perception also matters when it comes to your claims and marketing. Um, briefly, let's run through some evidence. And again, I've got some great videos. If you're not sure about some of these things, um, again, our masterclass, we actually talk about claims and evidence um, and we talk about some claims issues. So that's a great masterclass to join. Remember, go to our free blog page on our website. We have the link to the masterclass. It's totally free. And also on our workshops page, totally free. And again, you can get a lot more of this information even in, in our booklet. We also have a lot of examples in our booklet. And we've got some great videos that talk you through this in more detail. But you can also go to to our YouTube channel, heaps of free stuff. Just type in the search bar. You'll be amazed at the videos that come up. And if something's not there, then let us know because I could be doing a video for you. Um, so let's talk claims for a moment and let's also look at input carefully. So I do have several YouTube videos about using different actives. Um, so when you're using an active and you want to use that efficacy data, there's a lot of conditions about the use of that efficacy data. It's going to depend on the exact grade of the material. So if I'm using, say, a licorice extract, there's certain licorice extracts that are just in glycerin, for example, that will not have a whitening benefit, but they're still a licorice extract. Um, there's certain licorice extracts that have a fantastic fantastic whitening activity. They're very highly concentrated in the active constituents that, that bring about that effect. My point here is you can't just use an extract and think that because you've read somewhere that it will do something, that that extract is also going to have the same result. You need to have individual efficacy data for the exact grade of the material you're using if you're going to be using that as your evidence. You also need to make sure that you are using the exact material that has the efficacy data in the right proportion. So again, let's say um, I was using a really great whitening material. Let's say the efficacy data showed that it had, you know, a 15% um, lighter skin in 15 or 30 days, um, but it was being used in the formula at 2% and it was being used in a cream formula, 2% applied twice a day. A couple of things. I'd need to look at the and consider the skin type that it was used on because lightning Caucasian skin is very different to lightning Asian skin or lightning uh, African American skin, for example, or Caribbean skin. The, it, it is different. It works very differently. So I'd need to look at the efficacy data for who it was used on. Um, as I've mentioned it, in this example, it was 2% applied twice a day in a cream. So if I started to use that material at 5% once a week in a mask, I can't be using that same efficacy data because I don't know. Could I conduct my own evaluations? Yes, I could. We do have uh, an evaluations unit in our Diploma of Cosmetic Brand Management. And I've also got a free YouTube video that introduces you to the topic about conducting your own evaluations. So yes, you could with your mask and then prove that it has those results. But could you ascertain or you know, assume that this material would have the same effect in your once a week mask at 5%. No, you cannot do that. Um, you'd also need to consider issues of safety potentially uh, and also regulations definitely when it comes to whitening actives. So a couple of things there. Also, we need to consider we've used it in a cream delivery system. So if I was using it in a serum delivery system, I may not get the same results because the delivery systems are different, which means the penetration may be different, which means the performance and end results could be very, very different. I'd also need to consider the pH of the final product and its compatibility compatibility with that ingredient. So the point is there's a lot to consider about making sure that you hold the evidence to support the claim you're making. It must be specific to the material and it must be the way it's used. Now, if you also want to use that supplier's efficacy data in your marketing material, you need to make sure that you get their permission and you need to make sure that you name it specifically. Again, this is taught um, in our Diploma of Cosmetic Brand Management in particular. We've got a whole unit on labels and claims, and you can do this as a certificate program, our certificate in cosmetic labels and claims. Even if you're a 
a really, really small brand, you're selling to your neighbour, you need to make sure you're compliant. So that would be the very first unit that I would recommend to you there. And of course, that's part of our bigger diploma of cosmetic brand management. So it's professional training. Um, even starting at our masterclass, we even have some great tips there to help make sure you don't make these sort of errors, making you aware of what you don't know so that you either choose to learn it or get it checked by a consultant before you start to sell product. This is really, really important. Um, we might flick over to some questions. Um, let's have a look. Um, goodness me, let's see if I can catch up. Regulation questions. Which country has the best regulations that is accepted around the world? There isn't one. Right, a um, question also goes on to say, if you sell on the internet, let's talk about personal import schemes. Now, personal import schemes may be called slightly different things in different countries around the world, but the concept is still the same with your customs officers. So let's say I'm here in Australia, which has some pretty strict regulations. Let's say I was purchasing a product from another part of the world. Um, and let's say I'm only purchasing two or three jars and the directions for use on the jar would mean that I would be using up those two or three jars within three months. Could I purchase a product from another part of the world that then didn't comply with my Australian regulations? The short answer, unless there was something really highly toxic or prohibited um, or a massive customs issue, I potentially could. Um, and that is under a personal import scheme. Like I say, these exist in countries all over the world. They may call it something different. The concept is, and again, different countries in the world, you have to check. Sometimes it's six weeks worth of product. Sometimes it's three months. A lot of them have a three month allowance. The point is, if you are personally importing uh, a small quantity that would fit that six weeks or three months, depending on what your country has over it, you can, you can purchase it under a personal import scheme. Where it becomes a problem is if you are purchasing in commercial quantities. So could I purchase from an overseas website, something that doesn't comply, comply with Australian regulations in 20 units or more? No, no, I could not. That would be considered a commercial quantity. So I hope that that's helped the person asking that. That was actually a really good question, whoever answered that. And I hope that that's helped a lot of small brands out there because a lot of small brands are like, oh, well, I want to sell online. Does that mean I suddenly have to know every single country's regulations? No, you need to comply with your local country regulations um, and you can only ship or sell what would be considered a personal quantity to someone overseas. And again, just be careful. Some countries will allow six weeks worth of product. Some countries will allow three months. I know in Australia, it's three months. This doesn't mean it is like that for every other country around the world. So in other words, if someone's purchasing one or two jars and they're likely to use that in six or eight weeks, yes, you would probably be able to ship it without an issue. Where it could come unstuck is if it's a, a really dangerous or prohibited substance. Or sometimes, like for instance, when we send out our practical packs to students, we have now had to put synthetic beeswax into our packs because beeswax is a regulatory nightmare for customs because it's got to do with the bees. Um, so again, if it's something like that, you might have an issue. We're sending beeswax as a raw material um, and it's been a big issue. So we now send synthetic beeswax so that people can learn to use the material, but we couldn't sell, we couldn't send actual beeswax because of the customs issue. So there's an example where a raw material is a problem, for example, in a finished product, the small amount that gets used wouldn't normally be an issue. Um, if you were sending an entire tube that's basically just a beeswax balm, you might again run into a customs issue. And that's not something that you can really help if, if customs are prohibiting it to protect wildlife species, then that's a different story altogether. Um, for labelling, each and every preservative extract needs to be listed, even if the extract medium is the same. Uh, yes, if you're in the EU or UK, you need to list every single component of every single ingredient. So that means listing every single preservative and solvent that may also be present as part of that extract. Um, please remember that that needs to go into your label. Also, you need to make sure that you are listing essential allergen information. Your essential oils, even your organic essential oils contain allergens and they need to be listed on the label too when they're over 0.01% for a wash off product or when they're present at point, over point 
0.001% in a leave on product. And that is again an EU UK regulation. We have that um, in our masterclass. So again, please, if nothing else after today, please enjoy our free, it's totally free, um, our Cosmetic Formulation Fundamental Masterclass. We have that type of information in there for you. Like I say, we want to make sure that you get started right. There's so much misinformation on the internet. Um, I'm, I'm putting my foot down. I'm saying, no, learn it right. This is free. Please enjoy it. And we do have that sort of thing in there for you. Um, a question. Oh, we've got an extra preservative question here. So if you have some cosmetic, uh, uh, sorry, some regulation questions, please do ask. But we've got an extra preservative question here. Would an oil-soluble preservative be enough to preserve an anhydrous product that will come in contact with water during use? Again, you're not really going to need a preservative if it's a totally oil product. Even if it's coming into contact with a small amount of water, you're not. it's not normally coming into contact with enough water that you're going to need it. So I can't really advise you further if I didn't know the specific uh, situation, but just talking balms or lipsticks or, or you know, even just cleansing oils, those sort of things, the actual product that's in the packaging isn't going to need a preservative. Um, it, it may need an antioxidant. Antioxidants are not preservatives. And in fact, your antioxidants like your vitamin E can actually contribute to micro, uh, well, to feeding microorganisms. So they can actually be a food source. Um, but if you've got plant oils or essential oils, you do need to have an antioxidant present. Interesting on antioxidants, let's talk about this while we're there, um, that a lot of people get confused. They see a lot of extracts out there saying that they're antioxidants. Now, they may be antioxidants for the skin. It doesn't mean that they're an antioxidant for your formula. Even vitamin E acetate is an antioxidant for the skin, but it won't protect your formula. So please be careful. Make sure you're using a proper antioxidant to protect your formula. It does still have benefits for the skin, but... If you're not protecting your formula, if it's got uh, plant oils and essential oils, you need an antioxidant that's going to protect your formula in there. Uh, we've got another question. Oh, this is an eye-opener event. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, then lots of Cosmos approved preservatives are static. Not necessarily. No, a lot of Cosmos approved preservatives are actually synthetic. They're nature identical. That was that concept I mentioned before. Um, some of them are static. Some are natural. Very, very few are truly natural. A lot are nature identical and some of them are sidal. Um, but you need to know, you need to be sure about these things. What would be one example of a sidal preservative? Again, um, your sodium benzoate, potassium sorbate, the reason it works so well is it is a sidal preservative. Um, but again, it can be irritating. So it's not my first choice that I would use. There's, there's certain applications where it would work really well, but it wouldn't be my first choice because it can actually be quite irritating for people. Um, and in terms of limits, I'm not going to give you limits on this channel because I don't know what your formula is. And that would be really wrong of me to give you a flat out limit of what you should use because I don't know what your formula is. Uh, and I don't know what else is in there. And again, this is something that you need to learn properly. It's really irresponsible if I was to just give you a blanket statement because it's not going to apply to everyone's situation. Please understand this. Um, I'm just not going to do that to you. Uh, is mandelic acid regarded as glycolic acid in terms of its regulation? No, it's not. Okay, it's, it's a totally different substance. So again, that's a, a regulatory consideration. You do need to make sure you check your local country regulations and comply. Again, even if you're selling overseas, you need to make sure you comply with your local country regulations. So again, please make sure you know how to search that. We have uh, our Diploma of Personal Care Formulation and we also have our Certificate in Cosmetic Regulatory Essentials. These teach you full um, ingredient compliance in our certificate and cosmetic regulatory essentials you learn all of your compliance requirements your quality your stability your micro testing um, your ingredient uh, regulation and we talk, we cover multiple countries so we cover AU EU UK ASEAN US Japan China South Korea uh, South Africa, um, you can go to our website and find the full list that's off the top of my head um, did I get everyone there? I think I've forgotten someone. But basically, we teach all over the world. And it's because it's so important. Remember, our courses are professional level. They're not weekend courses. They're not 100-hour or 10-hour type courses. Our advanced certificates and our diplomas, our advanced certificates are 300 hours plus. Our diploma is 1,200 hours. So again, this is the type of level that you do learn so that you can make the correct choices and be compliant all over the world um, with the choices that you make. Um, I think that that's all the questions. 
I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. Like I say, if you want a summary of this, please go to our Dropbox folder where we keep all of our free formulas and free reports. Please go to our website on our free blog page. We have our uh, masterclass link and also on our workshop page, we have our masterclass link. This is the start of it. Just remember that what you learn with us when you actually enroll in one of our courses or even our study only options, they are so much more comprehensive uh, and, and you would get the full background learning uh, and, and training to know the subject matter really thoroughly. Um, but we've got a lot of this information out there to help you make the right choices from the start. So I want to thank you very much for joining me today. Now on Friday, we are going to be looking at, we're going to be doing uh, stability testing, and finding your product position. This is really important. If you're going to have a successful brand, you need to have the right product position. So we're going to be looking at that on Friday. Um, so thank you again for being a part of this with the questions that you've posted. And I hope to see you again on Friday. And of course, this live stream will be available on YouTube after we've finished. So over to you. Happy formulating.